Flat Earth Experiments Determining the shape of the Earth using tools, observations, and measurements you make yourself, all in your own backyard. Part 4. Path of the Sun This video will detail the third of four Sun observations. Again, I'm going to caution that you not look at the Sun directly, but instead use proper protection, so you don't hurt your eyes or your camera equipment. Please take this advice seriously. Just Google Observing the Sun for further guidance. Fortunately, in this experiment, we won't be looking at the sun, but rather marking shadows. Here's a quick overview. We're going to record the path of the sun throughout the day using a simple shadow stick sundial. The flat earth model says the sun moves in a circle at 3,000 miles altitude above the equator and tropics, centered at the North Pole. This will produce a pattern of shadows that will be a semicircle. The globe earth model says the sun path moves around the earth, producing a hyperbolic pattern of shadows. Supplies. We'll make a simple shadow stick out of some white cardboard or foam core, some modeling clay, and a toothpick or uncooked spaghetti. It will also be helpful to have either a compass or a compass app on your smartphone and a ruler. Here's the plan of attack. First, we'll make our shadow stick sundial. Then we'll spend one whole day from sunrise to sunset marking the shadows on your sundial. The next step is optional taking measurements from your shadow stick, and making calculations. Lastly, we'll take a look at the two models for the shape of the Earth and describe how the shadow pattern might relate to the path of the Sun in the Flat Earth or the Globe Earth model. The geometry in this section might get a little thick. Step 1. Making the Shadow Stick Sundial There are tons of options to making your shadow stick, but there are a few considerations. The stick called a gnomon, should be fairly short so you can capture long shadows, and the cardboard or foam core should be large enough to capture those shadows. You can use a toothpick held up with clay, or even a short piece of uncooked spaghetti. For a base, you'll use a large piece of cardboard. White paper taped to the top of a pizza box works fine. Or you can use a sheet of foam core. Use a lump of clay to mount your gnomon vertically, like a flagpole, and make sure it's mounted securely. I used a tiny ball of clay on top to give me a nice end to my shadow. Step 2. Marking shadows all day. Use your dedicated notebook for your data. While most of our markings will be on the base of the shadow stick assembly, you'll want to record other data for later analysis. Here is a sample logbook page for your data. Use as many of these blanks as you need. If you're interested in really diving into the data, you'll need all these values in the later sections when we do our calculations. As in previous videos, you'll want to record the official sunrise sunset times for your location using either a local newspaper or a website. This will help frame the times of your sun observations. You can also get the time of the sun's zenith by finding the halfway point between sunrise and sunset. At sunrise, take your shadow stick assembly and place it where it won't be disturbed for an entire day of sunshine, anywhere it has full exposure to the sky. Make sure the base is as level as you can get it, because slight angles can drastically change the length of shadows. Using an actual compass or a compass app on your smartphone, determine where due north is and mark it on the base. It's very important that the base not move for the next 12 hours or so of sunshine. Next, you just need to make a mark on the base for the end of, your sh of the shadow of your gnomon. Write the time next to each shadow. How often should you mark the shadow? You'll get sufficient results if you mark the shadow about five or so times throughout the day, evenly spaced from just after sunrise to just before sunset. For better results, try to record the shadow every hour. This will also allow you to draw some conclusions about the sun's speed in the flat earth versus the globe earth models. If you plan on doing some later analysis, you'll want to record the shadow at the sun's highest point in the sky, or zenith. If you recorded the official sunrise and sunset times for your location, you could figure out the zenith time on your own, or you can use a website like suncalc.org. When you record the zenith shadow, mark it with a different symbol, so you can tell it apart from your other hourly markings. When you get done your day's markings, stand over your shadow stick assembly and take a photo, which you can print and put into your notebook. Step 3. Optional. Taking measurements from your shadow stick and making calculations. There are four main measurements or values that we need. The exact height of the gnomon, h, the length of the shadow at the sun's zenith, z, and your latitude, lat. 
you'll also need the date. We will be analyzing our results with both the Flat Earth model and the Globe Earth model, so we'll just calculate all the numbers we need and analyze them later. First, accurately measure the height of your gnomon, h. Then measure the length of the shadow z from the base of the gnomon to the center of the shadow at zenith. These two measurements should be in the same units, for example, inches or centimeters. Next, find your latitude using a local map of your area or a website such as latlong.net. Pick a resource you trust. Using your latitude, perform this conversion to get your degrees of latitude from the North Pole. If you live in the Northern Hemisphere, simply subtract your latitude from 90. If you live in the Southern Hemisphere, simply add your South latitude to 90. The resulting value will give you how many degrees you are from the North Pole, from 0 to 180, which we'll label D. Multiply 69.06 times D times H and then divide by 3000 to find the center of rotation C. This is the length, in inches or centimeters, from the gnomon southward to the center of the sun's rotation on your base. Mark the base with the center of rotation. No matter your location on Earth, you'll measure C units, either inches or centimeters, due south from your gnomon. This will correspond to the North Pole on the flat Earth map. Lastly, we'll compute the angle of elevation of the sun at its zenith. First, carefully measure the length of the shadow you recorded when the sun was at zenith. It will be the mark that is closest to your gnomon. Label this shadow length at zenith Z. Now use the gnomon's height H and the shadow length at zenith to find the angle theta using tangent. The inverse tangent of H over Z is the zenith angle of the elevation of the sun. Now, we'll do a very interesting calculation to predict the zenith angle of the sun, based on the calendar. We'll start by finding how many days it is past the spring equinox in your hemisphere. Then convert this number of days to degrees by multiplying by 360 and dividing by 365. This means that the entire calendar is mapped over a 360 degree circle, with zero degrees representing the spring equinox and the seasons 90 degrees apart. When we map this onto a sine curve, it will give us the change in the elevation of the sun according to the globe earth model. Here's the final calculation. We'll use phi to represent our predicted zenith angle. Start with 90 minus your latitude, then add 23.5 times the sine of angle E. On the equinox on the globe, the sun's elevation at zenith is 90 degrees at the equator and zero degrees at the poles which means that the angle of elevation is 90 minus latitude. At other times of the year, the sun will be higher or lower. For example, at the summer solstice, or 90 degrees past spring equinox, the sun will be 23.5 degrees higher, based on the tilt of the globe, Earth's axis. Step 4. Flat Earth versus Globe Earth Analysis Again, in this series of 15 videos, we're only considering two models, the Flat Earth model and the Globe Earth model. As in previous videos, we'll start by looking at the behavior of the sun. In both models, making sense of our pattern of shadows will involve a bit of geometry, so please be patient. I'll try to explain things as best I can. To help this explanation, we'll actually use a physical model for Earth, a light source, and a miniature shadow stick. We'll approach the flat Earth first by explaining what a geometric analysis will predict our shadows to look like, and then we'll test our ideas using a physical model. We'll then repeat those two steps with the globe Earth. Let's get started. Part A, flat Earth geometric analysis. On the flat Earth model, the sun follows a circle above the equator or tropics at about a 3,000 mile elevation. This means that the sun travels in a flat plane parallel to the flat plane of the Earth. In geometry, when you have two parallel lines and a point between them, transversals that cross at this point and the parallel lines form similar triangles. The angles are the same and the sides are proportional. The same principle applies to parallel planes. Start with parallel planes with a point between. Lines drawn from one plane to the other through this common point will trace similar figures. If we consider this point to be the tip of our gnomon and the parallel planes to be the plane of the sun's path and the plane of the earth, we will get a miniature drawing for the shape of the sun's path in the sky, 
provided the sun travels in a plane. If you think about it, the tip of the gnomon is like the lens or the hole of a pinhole camera, and the paper on which you drew the shadows is the film, which should show a faithful reproduction of the plane in the sky. If the sun is traveling in a circle above the North Pole, then the markings on the base of your shadow stick should also indicate a perfect circle. Additionally, if you perform the calculations in step 3 of this video, you marked a point labeled C, or center of sun's orbit. This calculated point should actually be, the equ be equidistant to all the shadow markings, making it the center of the semicircle. This will be true anywhere in the world, regardless of whether you live north or south of the equator or right on it. If you were able to mark the shadow at evenly spaced intervals, such as one mark per hour, then these markings should be evenly spaced on the base, mirroring the constant speed of the sun as it travels the circle in the sky, centered on the North Pole. So, according to geometry, in the Flat Earth model, we'll see a semicircle for the pattern of shadows, no matter the season, no matter the location of the observer on Earth. The only variation is that the circular pattern will be wider during the North's winter and the South's summer, and smaller during the North's summer and the South's winter, as the sun travels above the Tropic of Cancer or Capricorn, respectively. Part B, Flat Earth Miniature Model. What happens when we test this theory with a physical model? Again, let's note that the Gleason's equidistant azimuthal flat earth map might not be perfect, but this does not change our analysis. The exact distance or location isn't important for analyzing the shadows produced by our gnomon, as we'll soon see. I have a beautiful poster-sized print of the Gleason map hanging in my kitchen, and I used a book light as the sun and a little index card with a half toothpick from my gnomon placed over the United States to represent Missouri. To represent the 12 hours of sunlight on the equinox, I moved the book light in a semicircle directly above the map's equator, marking the shadows every hour. I marked this pattern E. I then repeated the process for Missouri's summer solstice, when the summer is above the Tropic of Cancer, and marked the shadows, this time only every two hours. And then I did the same for the northern winter, when the sun is above the Tropic of Capricorn. This photo represents my miniature model at 6 p.m. on December 23rd. Even though the gnomon is off-center, the pattern each time was a perfect half-circle, with equally spaced marks, matching the prediction from geometry. Now let's discuss the, the Globe Earth model, Part C, Geometric Analysis. In this model, the path of the sun and how it relates to the shadow of our gnomon throughout the day is a bit more complicated, so we'll have to use some more geometry to get it right. The globe Earth model has the sun about 93 million miles away, and the Earth's counterclockwise rotation gives us night and day. This extreme distance to the sun is about 11,000 times the Earth's diameter, so in terms of the Earth-Sun relationship, the Earth can be considered to be a single point. If the globe Earth were the size of a basketball, the sun would be a gymnasium about two miles away. What this means is that an observer's location on Earth doesn't matter in terms of distance to the equator or even distance to the axis. The only thing that matters is latitude, which affects the angle an observer sees the sun. This means that when the Earth rotates to give us the apparent motion of the sun in the sky, it's really dependent on our latitude and the angle the equatorial ring makes with the sun. Since it's the Earth that's rotating, the sun will always trace a perfect circle around an observer on Earth. And on the equinox, our observer will be in the exact center. I want to repeat this last point because in my research into sun motion and what that means for a globe Earth observer, it took me a while to figure this out. On the equinox, every observer on a globe Earth is in the exact center of the circle that the sun makes in the sky. This means that the shadow traced by the gnomon will be in a straight line every equinox. When in summer, for the northern hemisphere, winter and southern, the sun appears to travel in a circle slightly northward than at equinox, resulting in the red curve. On the winter solstice, we'll get the green curve. Since the sun traces a giant circle in the sky, and when the gnomon is the point, it produces a cone, which intersects the base of our shadow stick sundial. 
This means that the shadow traced by the gnomon will be a conic section, specifically a hyperbola. As with the flat earth model, what happens when we test this geometric theory with a physical globe? Part D, miniature model. I took a standard earth globe and placed a book light several feet away. I mounted an index card and a partial toothpick over the United States again. Then I aligned the axis of the globe to be perpendicular to the sun, as it is during equinox, and I began marking shadows. I marked a series of shadows which fell in a straight line representing fall or spring equinox. I repeated the process tilting the axis more towards the sun, not exactly the summer solstice, more of a midsummer alignment, and then I marked some more shadows, which represented a hyperbola. I discovered that I wouldn't be able to do the same with the winter months as my card was too small, but watching the shadow I could see that it would be another hyperbolic curve pointing in the other direction. As with the flat earth scenario, the prediction from geometry matches our results from our physical model. To review the two models and how they relate to the path of the sun in the sky, in the flat earth model, the sun's circular motion parallel to the plane of the earth produces a circular pattern of shadows. The center of these circular patterns is proportional to the location of the North Pole. The circular pattern will have greater radius in December and a smaller one in June for the solstices and a medium-sized one for the equinoxes. In the globe Earth model, the rotation of the Earth gives the appearance of the Sun moving in a circular pattern, producing a conic section or a hyperbolic pattern of shadows most of the year. On the equinoxes, every location on Earth will produce a straight line pattern of shadows. How does your path of the sun relate? If it appears to move in an almost perfect semicircle, this supports the flat earth model. If you did the calculations in part three, you marked the theoretical center of rotation corresponding to the North Pole. Are your shadows all equidistant from this point? On the other hand, if the shadow follows a hyperbolic pattern or a straight line on the equinox, this supports the globe earth model. If you measured your zenith angle and did the calculations in part three, does it relate to the predicted zenith angle based on globe earth geometry? Again, note that this doesn't prove anything. The data you gathered simply might support one model over another. To be even more certain, more data gathering is needed from a variety of sources, as we'll discuss in the rest of the series. Our next video is number five, shape and features of the sun. It will require a solar filter such as a number 14 welder's glass. When commenting on this or any other video, please keep an open mind and remember to be kind to each other. Practice what Stephen Covey recommends. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. Thank you.